Dr. Gong Thikpin, Director of the Clinical Research Center, Ministry of Health, Dr. John Whitmore, Acting Vice Chancellor of Taylor's University, Dr. Barbahagia Dato Dato, Dato Dato, Distinguished Guests and Speakers, Ladies and Gentlemen. Good morning and a warm welcome to the Big Data in Healthcare Forum 2016. My name is Provident Lai and I am a fourth year pharmacy student from the School of Pharmacy at Taylor's University and I am humbled to serve as your MC for the morning session of this forum. To begin with the opening ceremony, please join me in welcoming Professor P.T. Thomas, who is the Chairman of the Organizing Committee, to deliver his welcoming speech. Dr. Go Pikpin, Director of Clinical Research Centre, Kuala Lumpur, representing the Deputy Director General of Health, Research and Technical Support Ministry of Health, Dr. John Whitmore, Acting Vice Chancellor, Taylor's University, Mr. John McHenry, Country Manager, Pfizer, Malaysia, Sindhya and Brahat. Professor Andrew Morris, Professor of Medicine, Director of the Usher Institute of Population Health Sciences and Informatics, University of Edinburgh. Yambagya Dato Mohamad Azman, Dato Aziz Mohamad, CEO of SOXO. Azman is not here yet, maybe here later. Dr. Mohamad Kaze bin Sheikh Hamad. Deputy Director, Center for Health Informatics, Ministry of Health, Mr. Ho Man Kiat, Vice President and National Practice Leader, Employee Health and Benefits, Marsh Insurance Brokers, Malaysia, Sudan, Mr. Simon Thomas, Partner and Vice President at IBM, Business Analytics and Strategy Leader, Asia Pacific, Yang Babagia, Dato Dato, Datin Datin, Professors, senior government officers, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the organizing committee, it is my pleasure to welcome you to this first ever Big Data in Healthcare Forum. The theme of the forum is, are we ready for the era? The era of Big Data, which has tremendous potential for healthcare and for improving health outcomes. I want to thank Dr. Go Pin, representing the Deputy Director General of Health, Dr. Shanas Murad, who accepted our invitation to be at this forum and declare it open. Unfortunately, just a few days ago, Dr. Shanas was asked to attend a very important meeting this morning, and she has requested Dr. Go to represent her at this event. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a lineup of highly distinguished persons as our speakers at this forum. I want to thank each of the speakers for readily accepting our invitation. If the quality of an event is evaluated based on the expertise, standing and positions occupied by the speakers, then I can confidently say that we are going to have a very high quality world-class forum. I also want to thank the participants who very enthusiastically indicated their interest to participate in the forum. When we st first started planning for the forum, we planned for about 70 participants. Then we increased it to 120. And finally today we have on our list more than 200 participants. Actually, one of our initial concerns when we were planning for the forum was that this hall can hold 200 persons, and we were planning for 70, and our initial concern was the hall would look very empty uh, with just 70. But uh, that doesn't seem to be a problem, although there are some spaces to be filled. Uh, but as we go along, I hope they get filled up. Okay, so to all the participants, thank you for your interest, and thank you for being here. Ladies and gentlemen, in our planning, we decided that we, that we would not charge the participants any registration fee. This was because Pfizer very kindly and generously provided an education grant to conduct this forum. Actually, it was Pfizer who also initiated the idea of holding a big data in healthcare forum. Our thanks to Mr. John McHenry, country manager, 
and Ms. Azwa Kamaruddin, Director, Corporate Affairs, Health and Value of Pfizer Malaysia, for your strong support to education, to healthcare, and most specifically to the School of Pharmacy of Kansas University. Finally, I wish to thank the organizing com committee made up of members from the School of Pharmacy, School of Communication, School of Medicine, Facilities Management, Temptations, Restaurant, and many other departments of Taylor's University, and the Clinical Research Center Kuala Lumpur and Pfizer Malaysia. We started working together around August 2015, and I'm happy to say that we are still friends and talking to each other. <laughs> That's probably an indication of uh, how well we got along in organizing this. So thank you once again to the organizing committee uh, for all your hard work, uh, your cooperation, and your effort in attempting to make this forum a success. I also wish to thank my students who are outside helping, running around, greeting the participants, and also the MCs who who are students for this day. The committee has worked hard to put together this first of its kind forum and ladies and gentlemen we hope that this will lead to further collaboration and cooperation in big data in healthcare. Thank you very much. Thank you Thomas for his welcoming speech. Next we would like to invite Dr. John Whitmore, the Acting Vice Chancellor of Taylor's University to say a few words. So new this is my very first conference introduction, so uh, it's a great pleasure to be here with you today, and I'd like to welcome Dr. Gopi Lin for being here um, and representing um, the Clinical Research Center, which is very important to the future of Malaysia, uh, to um, also uh, John McHenry, uh, country manager for Pfizer, and for particularly uh, Vicky Thomas, our lead and the um, organizer, uh, although I know it's a collective effort to put something like this together, but it's his vision and uh, um, impetus that got this important program going. So I'd like to welcome you to Lakeside campus, this beautiful campus on this uh, wonderful morning. Notice how quiet it is. Later in the week here, it will be busy with returning students for uh, starting the next semester. So uh, in some ways, you came in a good time when you can park on campus and get on campus. And, uh, but it will be a lively and active place uh, later on um, in this week. So uh, research, uh, the bringing together of people from different disciplines, uh, really smart people who know a lot and, uh, and come together at the university is one of our major functions. So we're very glad to have you all here today. Um, School of Pharmacy, School of Communication, Clinical Research Center, Ministry of Health, each individually are important to our country and to the future of Malaysia. But assembling the brain power of those uh, different entities and having you participate in this event is what universities are all about and what a better future is all about. Taylor's University believes in holistic education and we look to organize forums that examine all aspects of a given subject where staff and students can learn and uh, we have an international as well as a national perspective. So we're very happy to uh, host this event today, the university as a whole, and our school of pharmacy as well. It's bringing people together to look at important issues that uh, will help solve uh, the, the problems of today and make it a better future. And I have a personal challenge, if you don't mind, to Pfizer and to Big Data and Pharmacy. <coughs> Two weeks after I was here, I got dengue fever. <laughs> so I want you all to find an antivirus for this uh, unpleasant disease. And I know a lot of people are working on it. 
So I'm partly saying this in jest, but uh, that's one area where pharmacy and uh, research and big data might be able to help us. Uh, so I challenge you to do that as soon as possible because I hear that I could get it again and uh, I'd rather not. So my point being, this is important work, whatever it is that's being uh, discovered through the use of big data and pharmacy and uh, medicine. And uh, in this conference will take us one step further. So thank you for having me here today. Fortunately or unfortunately, I have some guests from the United States uh, that are arriving about now, and so I hope to come back and listen to some speeches later, but I'm unfortunately going to have to exit. Uh, I think I can stand at the top for your presentation, and then I'll have to leave, and I'd rather do that now. So thank you all for being here. Dr. John Bicot. Dr. Lato, Dr. Indane, distinguished guests and speakers, ladies and gentlemen, it now gives me great pleasure to invite Dr. Go Pin, the Director of Clinical Research Center, Ministry of Health, to deliver her opening address and to declare open the forum. Dr. John Moore, the, I think Vice Chancellor, the other I, I know that you are immune to at least one serotype of the dengue virus, so you are protected completely. Not two, but the one that responds to the dengue vaccine. And Mr. John McHenry, country manager, Pfizer Malaysia, Sandra Merhart, Professor Kitty Thomas, the Dean and School of Pharmacy, as well as the or Chairman of the Organizing Committee, Taylor's University, Ms. Josephine Tan, the Dean of School of uh, Communication, Taylor's University, Directors of the National Institute of Health, of the Ministry of Health, respected speakers, Distinguished uh, guests as well as members of the media, ladies and gentlemen. It gives me great pleasure to see so many of you uh, coming to join us at this Big Data Forum. I would think this is the first one that's at least organized by the Ministry of Health of this team. And many people ask me what is it about, and I have to tell them I'm not quite sure and wait for Andrew Morris to come and explain to us because many people, people have different definitions about Big Data. So I once again want to apologize to Dr. Shannas Murat, who very much want to be here with us because as the Ministry of Health also going towards the uh, National Health Care System research and other research activities, they eventually need to know what big data is all about, but she has to sincerely apologize that she has to attend another meeting. And um, ladies and gentlemen, we currently live in this ICT advancement. For morning breakfast, many of you get up and check what's at, right? And then, Coming to Taylor University Lakeside, you use waves, <laughs> and then eventually the whole day we are actually surrounded by this ICT in the daily life, and certainly in the commercial uh, um, commercial companies and industry. But in healthcare, we uh, are also also collecting a lot of data from our recent exercise in the national healthcare system research. We found we collected so much of data that uh, we need to use them. So. Um, let us let me again uh, and on behalf of Dr. Shanas extend her thanks to the organizing committee, which I'm part of it, for uh, inviting her here. So this is her welcome and first. In the healthcare, especially when we take care of patients, every patient encounter that we collect data from patients, information, clinical data to help to lab to all the processes. And eventually these data are currently held in various segments. In the Ministry of Health itself, we do have some initiative with the team in IC, uh, telehealth as well as health information system. Very much into ICT many years ago, and currently we have 28 hospitals in the Ministry of Health with electronic health records, with electronic and medical records, and more than uh, like around 100 health clinics with daily primary care, which is the EMR for primary care health clinics. We also have oral health clinical information system as well as the uh, various public health notification and surveillance system, which is all IT with e -Dengi. And I think we can click e and see John's name appearing there. Uh, as well as what uh, the minister has just launched about uh, three weeks ago in more on the uh, pharmacy and medication information system. All these efforts show that Mr. Health is very much concerned about the 
use of ICP to enhance health care. However, the quality health care system in the clinic, private GP and hospital, we don't see that much of uh, maybe some challenges in having the ICP in their hospital where data linkages can be done. However, although I say we have a lot of data, last one year when we are doing this Malaysia health care system research, we found that many of these data cannot be used because they are stored or kept in different formats and um, data quality is an issue and certainly the new information, the new protected personal data protection, people now define that so rigidly that we can't even have access to this data even though we are in the Ministry of Health. So all this issue pertaining to big data is a concern and we hope this conference, this forum will enlighten us on some of this issue and maybe pave the way for more open discussion among us, uh, public hospital, Ministry of Health, universities as well as private hospitals and university, uh, teaching university as well as industry. And um, the other good news I'd like to share is that our government is actually quite, it's very actually committed to the uh, ICT development. In the private, you can see that. But in the Ministry of Health, if you have read the thick document on the 11th Malaysian plan, which is the plan that the country had for every five years, you will see that uh, ICT is actually one of the strategic tasks for the, and the big data is being focused upon. So I think all these components come into place and this forum will certainly uh, help us in understanding how to implement 60% of the audience of people here are Ministry of Health. We have to help Ministry of Health to implement the 11 Malaysian plan, which will be only five years. And we are time flies and in no time, the year 2020, we have to deliver, because it is sitting in front of me here, so help us deliver the uh, target set for 11 Malaysian plan. And the Malaysian plan come about there was money, then we, hopefully the budget will not be cut for ICT development. We also foresee challenges as what I mentioned just now. Besides those I mentioned, is also training. People who, who need to be trained thinking outside differently in dealing with data and infrastructure. It's therefore very timely that we have this conference and I hope um, with the, the uh, speaker's um, knowledge in various aspects of e-data, we'll learn more about it. But I wanted to mention particularly mention Ms. Yvonne Lee who actually come up with this idea of having the big data forum and me and Thomas agree to her many good ideas to have this wonderful program set up and we also like to thank all the speakers traveling from overseas far from Scotland to in the cold, cold Scotland to the very hot Malaysian weather and many of you from Malaysia and to come from your knowledge in industry and other uh, other areas. I thus wish you a very fruitful forum and please officially declare to launch the big data in health care for 2016. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gopin. Okay, our next item on our program is the first lecture, and with that, we would now like to invite the chairperson for the morning sessions, Professor P.T. Thomas, to chair the session. We are very fortunate, as I said earlier, to have very uh, highly qualified and experienced speakers for this forum. And our main speaker for this forum is Professor Andrew <coughs> Morris. Professor Morris is a professor of medicine and the director of the Asher Institute of Population Health Sciences and Informatics and vice principal of data science at the University of Edinburgh. Prior to this, Professor Andrew was dean of medicine at the University of Dundee. He is seconded as chief scientist at the Scottish Government Health Directorate which supports and promotes high quality research aimed at improving the quality and cost effectiveness of services offered by NHS Scotland and securing lasting improvements to the health of the people of Scotland. He is director of the FAR Institute in Scotland, funded by the Medical Research Council and nine other funders and convener of the UK Health Informatics Research Network, representing £39 million sterling investment in health informatics research. Professor Morris's research interest spans health informatics and chronic diseases. Professor Andrew Morris is an international, internationally recognized expert on big data in health and is frequently invited to speak at meetings and conferences. Please join me in welcoming Professor Morris. Professor Whitmore, he's still here. Um, Professor Thomas, and also to thank 
you want, but I think a great idea for putting on what I think is an important uh, conference. So, Salamat Padji. <laughs> I was, I was reflecting last night, I think it was my 10th visit to Malaysia. I first came to Kuching in 1985, um, where I spent four months in East Malaysia. And last night when I was recounting this story to Professor Thomas, we went out to some fantastic nasi goreng. I've not had it for 30 years, and it's just as good as I, I remember. So it's a great pleasure to uh, be back. And today I want to talk about um, data science and big data in healthcare. And suggest to you, I think it was Bill Gates who suggested that healthcare is the last, the last major industry not to be transformed by the information age. And I think it's time that we address that collectively. And I'm delighted to say to see today that the uh, the organizers have brought together various sectors. But to solve this, we will need deep collaboration between government, the health services themselves, academia, and industry, because this is a complex, complex issue. Um, I actually said that in Brussels a few weeks ago, healthcare is the last major industry not to be transformed by the information age, and a German put his hand up the back and said, oh, you're on shipping hasn't been transformed yet. But we're not, we're not in very good company if we can't use data. And it's not only about delivering better quality care to individual patients. In my view, it's about the sustainability of health systems internationally. Health systems are characterized by waste, variation, and harm, and only with the application of information and data science in real time Will we drive up efficiency and effectiveness? So um, let's see if this works. Uh, so I'm going to speak for about 45 minutes, leave lots of time for questions. Um, I'm going to talk about challenges which face uh, uh, face us all: the so-called rise and rise of chronic. And I'm going to suggest that in Malaysia, should you be thinking that you can gear up the entire country for, um, uh, for high quality uh, care and research using information science and big data as the catalyst for change. I'm going to suggest that to achieve this requires this, this interdependency and deep collaboration across multiple sectors. And also, as uh, Dr. Ko Big Pin emphasized, that with big data goes big responsibility. Because we need to do this in a trustworthy way so that we can get the public to do this. And what we're trying to see is a convergence of care with research. How do we accelerate research findings into the clinic for patient and public benefit? So that's the script. But uh, before I did that, I thought I'd give you a bit of UK history. So uh, this is the birth of the National Health Service. And we're quite proud of the National Health Service. It's outseen 14 prime ministers, so it's pretty durable. And it was launched in July 1948. Here's the, the, the chap who invented it, a guy called Nye Bevan. Some people suggest this is Mrs. Thatcher in the bed listening very <laughs> very carefully. And he said it's quite the most ambitious adventure in the care of national health that any country has ever seen. Because it's a, a, a complete socialized system for health care funded by the government. And I'll touch upon the value of that later. But in 1948, so that was uh, it's almost 70 years ago now, something just as special but on a much smaller scale was happening in this place. John, do you know where that is? It's your part of the world. Uh, <laughs> just south of your port uh, Do you know where that is? So, so this is a this is a, a little town 40 miles due west of Boston in Massachusetts. Does anyone know where it is? You're nodding vigorously. Do you know where it is? It's Framingham. Have you heard of Framingham? So this is a little case study. So it was in 1948, the same year that the health service was launched, that all 5,200 town residents 
got together and agreed to do regular health checks. Okay? There are now three generations of participants, and it's truly iconic from a research perspective. I would argue it's one of the first examples where healthcare providers, citizens, and scientists came together to do something special. Deep collaboration across sectors. So what did they do? This book is a little stubborn. Should I be pointing it in a certain direction? <laughs> you can tell it's a big data conference. <laughs> <laughs> this is not working. Uh, okay, we'll just try with it. So what did they do? They they mustered the community and they got measures taken, so measurements. So they collected data basically on high blood pressure, smoking, cholesterol, blood sugars, and then they track them longitudinally and define the incidence of heart attacks and stroke, all from 5,200 people. And, oh dear, this is not working. There we go. Uh, Claude Lafont, who is uh, president of the NIH, in his shattered lecture suggested that Framingham has resulted in an average of four extra years of life because of the data they collected on that community or cohort and followed them up for 10, 20, 40, 50 years. And indeed, in the UK, if you go to a general practitioner and you don't have heart disease, yet they say, I want to assess your risk, your predicted risk, they'll plug in your blood pressure, your blood sugar, your smoking status, and they use the equations, the mathematics that's derived from framing them to calculate your future risk. So 5,200 people have indeed had a global impact on, <laughs> no, you're trying hard, um, on, on the health of individuals. And with classical American modesty, if you, uh, if you log on to their civic website, they suggest that um, Framingham is the town that changed America's heart. Isn't it a remarkable thought? 5,000 people tracked intensively. So this is data science going back 70 years. Next slide. But we're, we're, we've got a new, and I'll touch upon this, a new horizon. And we now live in the world of genomic medicine. And Martin Bobro, a um, friend of mine, who's a governor of the Wellcome Trust, suggested it's rather like reaching the top of a mountain pass like the Cameron Highland. <laughs> and seeing in front of you a fertile plain rich with new ideas, new methods, new techniques and concepts for understanding the complexity of human biology and health and disease. Because we understand the gene genome better, we're unraveling complex diseases and understanding molecular etiology of disease. And this is beginning to transform medicine. I think that is a great quote. It could have been improved if he had said, and informatics is fundamental to the success of this revolution in science. So I've just said that in quite a <laughs> So next, next slide. <laughs> and you can see how demographic pressures are changing, and I'm sure it's the same in Malaysia. And the challenge we have is that there are insufficient people in the working age to actually maintain the expectations and health status and social welfare of people who are aging. So that's one thing, a demographic pressure. And that's why in the UK, pensions uh, have been really diminished in value and people are now being expected to work from 65 to 70 to 75. But what we're also seeing is a rise and rise of chronic disease. Next slide. The other thing we're seeing is the increased isolation of people. And they're very interested to know what's happening in Malaysia. So back in the 60s, you can see that very few people lived alone. So single person households were really uncommon. But now you can see that single person households are the, are the most common type. So that means isolation. And if you're living with chronic disease alone, it's, it, it, it presents a challenge to health care systems. Next slide. And the next, the, the, the next thing we're um, uh, wrestling with is social inequalities in health. So this is, has anyone been to Scotland? I should ask that. Oh, not enough, I need to boost our tourism. <laughs> but if you go to Glasgow in Scotland, so this is a train line, so it's like going across Kuala Lumpur. But what we've shown 
that for every stop, this is the affluent part of town, every stop on the line was a drop of 1.7 years in male life expectancy because of social deprivation. So these are the challenges that are facing this next slide, Katie, you're doing really well. So what I talked about a rise and rise of chronic disease, how does that, how does that present itself? And a concept that we need to embrace in health systems is one of multi-morbidity, and we're not good at this. So this is a data science study of almost 2 million people in Scotland. We published in The Lancet a few years ago, and we asked a very simple question. As you go up that demographic profile, what is the mix of um, living with chronic diseases? So let's take the age of 70, which isn't old these days. Few people have zero or one chronic diseases. Most people are living with two, three, four, five, six, up to 15 chronic diseases. So it's comorbidity. And I'm sure it's the same in Malaysia, but in the UK, we have a very disease-centric view of the world. So I think this presents a fundamental challenge to this single disease focus that pervades medicine. And how does that play out in practice? So I, I'm a, I do diabetes, so I see my uh, people living with diabetes on a Friday. And sometimes I see patients who on, see me on a Friday. On a Monday, they've seen the renal physician. On the Tuesday, the ophthalmologist. On the Wednesday, the cardiac surgeon. And on the Thursday, the vascular surgeon. So our, our, our health systems are not fine-tuned to deal with multimorbidity. And why? Because we don't information share across the system. Next slide. The other thing which uh, I understand, speaking to Professor Thomas, that's challenging us is, is the financial situation that we're living. We're still suffering from the global crash of 2008. And there isn't enough money to fund health systems, basically. Not least in the states where Almost 20% of GDP is being targeted for healthcare. That is not sustainable. Worse if you get about 8% of GDP. I don't know, what's it in Malaysia? Do you know? Seven. Seven. So, so I think speaking to folk like Don Berwick, um, we should be sitting somewhere between sort of 8 and 11. We're actually going down, but uh, unless we are able to deliver better quality care and reduce costs, <coughs> we're, going to, we're going to struggle. Is my flicker working? Did you try it? Oh, yeah, it is. Okay, I'll do that. Thank you, Peggy. So, so what we're trying to do um, is drive quality health care and research from the basic science to the community and use data science or big data to accelerate this pathway. Um, classically, it's suggested it takes at least 15 years for basic science discovery to make it into the clinic. So how can we use data to drive and accelerate that pathway? And this is a governmental issue, it is a health system issue, because we need to support systems to deliver better quality care at reduced cost. We can't just keep adding cost. So, um, okay. so that's the backdrop. So what is this big data thing? Um, I think it's recognized internationally that healthcare has been slow to adopt so-called data science. And there's too many, too many definitions here, but just to be clear, what do I mean by data science? By data science, I mean the intersection of mathematics, statistics, computer science, and healthcare. So it's how do we bring these new technologies and new knowledge into healthcare? And in the UK, it was David Cooksey about 10 years ago who suggested, if you look at the translational pathway, we've been really, really slow at embracing new techniques like text mining, medicinal informatics, automated experimentation or machine learning into healthcare. We've been using a paper-based system to actually track care of patients and population. So, 
So, um, and this is revolutionizing other industries. So I, I flew in this morning and I checked on the airplane I had, it had Rolls-Royce engines. You've heard of Rolls-Royce engines? Other industries have used so-called real-time data to really fine-tune performance from their business. So I know, because it's a friend of mine, Rolls-Royce have a console, I think it's in Singapore actually, which is called Engine Health. And what this team of scientists and engineers do is tracks in real time the performance of every Rolls-Royce engine in the sky on the planet. So that when the plane lands, they can get a bag of spanners out and go and fine tune them. Now that is called predictive analysis. Do we do that in healthcare? But this is where the opportunities lie. So, big data is an international phenomenon. And the thesis is, this is Shakespeare, not William Shakespeare, uh, but Stefan Shakespeare. He suggested, do you agree with this? The digital revolution is entering a new phase, okay? First, it was about connectivity in new ways that hugely increase communication, all right? Uh, America won. Are there any Americans? <laughs> so I can say America sadly won. <laughs> Why did America win? A large single market, good basic science, innovation, entrepreneurial culture. Okay. So this is about sharing information. Think of Google, eBay, Facebook, Amazon, PayPal, Yahoo, Microsoft, Twitter, and Apple all headquartered on the west coast of America. Who here hasn't used a product from one of those companies in the last 30 minutes? <laughs> it is pervasive, doesn't it? So the argument is that we're seeing a new phase, and this is around how we learn, this is big data. How do we learn from information in real time? And the sense is, this will allow us to adapt and improve public services and businesses and enhance our whole way of life, bringing economic growth, which is what government wants, social benefits and improvement in how government works. That's what we all want. Uh, and this will have public sector information at its very foundation. And some countries are very fortunate because they've got reams and reams and reams of public sector information but it's siloed and it's not used. So the question is, can we, in a trustworthy way, unleash the power of these uh, big data? Next slide. So what I'm gonna do is just give you one or two examples, because that was all very theoretical. Uh, so one or two examples of how we're trying to do that. And I've talked about the spans of the bridge. Basic science, clinical research, which I'm gonna speak about this afternoon but care, because that's why we're all here. We want to improve the care of patients and populations. So, next slide, a few, a few case studies, and I will use Scotland as the case study. I hope you like the new official map of Scotland. <laughs> so, um, I understand that five million people live in KL, is that right? About five million? Registered, see, residents, yeah. Yeah, unregistered ones. All right. <laughs> You'll have to tell me about that. <laughs> so we spend 12 billion pounds on healthcare for 5 million people. I was hearing you've got 133 hospitals in Malaysia, is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So we've got 30, so we're a bit small, 38 hospitals, a thousand general practices, but we've collaborated for years and we've also used a unique patient identifier. And I think this is, this is not rocket science, but it works. Next slide. So this is our, this is too busy this slide, this is our health service on a slide. We're really good at measuring activity. So we know we've got 16,500 beds, 12,000 doctors, 56,000 nurses. Next slide. And we map that into activity. So 16 million general practice appointments, about 1.5 million hospital admissions per annum. And every year we see an increase. So the challenge we have is to move beyond activity to measure clinically meaningful outcomes, so-called phenotypes for patients and populations. Next slide. 
And we do that through the use of the unique patient identifier. So this is my number, so uh, my date of birth. Uh, sex, there are not five sexes in Scotland. <laughs> and a check, so it's a tangentive number. I understand that you also have a civil ID number. The question is, can you harness that in a trustworthy way? So next slide. What that enables you to do is that, because every health system in the world is fragmented and siloed. Our poor patients often have to go from general practice to hospital, to screening, for laboratory investigations, pharmacist in Professor Thomas, and the data do not follow. And he or she has to say again and again, and it's these gaps in care which actually is where the harm lies. The next slide. So three examples of how we've said, right, we're going to do this for the whole country. It's easy to do this in your local hospital. It's easy to do it in the general practice. The challenge is to weave it together across journeys of care of individual patients. If you can't achieve that, quality goes down. So three quick examples. Next slide. So this is a so-called emergency care summary. So in our general practices, there are a thousand of them. We've got good electronic health records. What happens, however, if I'm admitted to a hospital when I'm on holiday in Glasgow? Well, what can happen is the clinician can, it's available nationwide, view my electronic health record with explicit consent. We do it three and a half million times per annum and it changes management in 20%. Pure and simply by having the information at the point of care. Next slide. Economies of scale. So imaging is becoming a really important diagnostic tool in medicine. The cost of imaging will be going up and up and up. So again, we've got a nationwide approach to all MRIs, CTs, ultrasounds, mammography, endoscopy, video imaging. And actually by putting together a nationwide service, it reduces re-examinations by 10%. So this is the duplication in the system. Because often, if an x-ray is not there, what will doctors do? They say, oh, we'll just get another. But actually, it provides the information. Someone said that the most expensive development in medical technology is the doctor's pen. <laughs> <laughs> because they order a lot of tests. But it's about, um, and what we now have is a database of 17 million studies for care and research. Serial measurements. Next slide. So here's an example of chronic disease so with colleagues. So for the last 15 years, we have got, had a single clinical information system for every person living with diabetes in Scotland. There are, our prevalence is about 5.1%. I think in Malaysia, it's probably about 12%. <coughs> Those above 80, 7.8% are in the 8%. 8%, yeah. So, so we've got about 30,000 type 1s, the rest of type 2. And this is a real time. It links, produces that jigsaw for diabetes. Next slide. And it's shown here. We call it Sky Diabetes. So it goes into the general practices, agrees data standards. It goes into laboratories, into um, the hospital. Next slide. It's a great clinical tool. So this is what I see. I can see biochemistry over time. Keep going. I can see the names of my patients, where they come from, next slide. I can see uh, everything graphed in real time, next slide. I can see their prescribing, so I know everything that they've been prescribed across the nation, next slide. I can see what the podiatrist has done, the uh, specialist nurse has done, next slide. I can see all their imaging. Does anyone know what that is? <laughs> Digital retinopathy. It's all in one place. And now patients access these data themselves. Next slide. So since 2000, about the last 10 years, as a nation, we've been recording these key biomedical markers. So you need your sugar done, your blood pressure done, your cholesterol done, and your urine on about 95% of the entire population. Next slide. But what we've also shown, we've published on this, is that things get better. So 
Amputation rates have gone down 40%. Blindness, it doesn't show very well, has gone down by about 40%. If you have systematic approach to that journey of care, it makes a difference. Next slide. And in fact, life expectancy is, this is, type, this is the largest study of life expectancy of type 1 diabetes anywhere. So it's still unacceptable that men lose about 11 years and women about 12 years for type 1 diabetes. But these are still some of the best figures published internationally by having the data. Next slide. So what I'm going to speak about this afternoon is the research dimension which is really about how do you use the system, big data, to drive trials, innovation, and translation in our clinical research centers and networks, and how do we harness uh, data science. But I just wanted to show you one or two practical examples of how we can use information across the patch. So I'll talk about it this afternoon. We're trying to create a clinical research laboratory for the world. And I would argue that Malaysia could to in terms of providing uh, a unique environment for clinical research. Next slide. Uh, next slide. So that's what I'm going to talk about this afternoon. But what I'm going to do this morning is talk about more applied case studies of where big data can offer value. Just one or two snippets. And I would argue, if I was a government minister, I would just, I'd be saying, show me the evidence this has value. Show me it can prevent disease, lead to earlier diagnosis, safer and more effective treatments, integrated pathways, tells me how to spend my money, how it drives clinical research, and how it supports decision medicine. If I was a minister, I'd be wondering, what is the return on investment? So I spend money on this, and not on a new road, or a new educational initiative. So I'm gonna show you one or two examples. Next slide. So prevention of disease. Do you have a smoking ban in public places here? Yes. Well done. So. Uh, We're on the highway. Are on highway? Pardon? Highway. Are yeah. on highway? Not allowed to smoke. Not allowed to smoke on the highway too. Are on Oh, that's good. That's more advanced. That's more progressive than we thought. I think we're going to recruit Dr. Kovic <laughs> Pig to the UK. <laughs> But the, the question is, did the smoking ban work? Do you know if it worked in terms of disease? Well, here's evidence. So what we did is, it, it, in, in the UK, we brought it in in Scotland in 2006, and in, um, in the rest of the UK in 2007. So we used our routine data. So this is data we already had, and we said, what difference did it make to acute coronary syndrome? And what difference did it make to childhood asthma? Both of these were published in the New England Journal. And we compared ourselves with England because we were ahead and we, we could look at seasonal variation. So the bottom line was acute <coughs> coronary syndrome, admissions fell by 70%. Wasn't that great? Most interestingly, 67 to the extent of reduction was in non smokers, suggesting that the dangers of passive smoking were probably very much underestimated. So if you, if, you, uh, if you have a smoking ban, it's good for acute coronary syndrome. How about childhood admission for asthma? Again, this is routine data, which I'm sure you'll have in Malaysia. How many kids have been admitted with asthma? So before the ban, we were seeing a gradual increase of 5% per annum. After the ban, an 18% decrease. So it, it's nice data to be able to look at the effectiveness of policy. So using data to inform government policy. Next slide. Earlier diagnosis. So now I'm going to move on to a theme of stratification. We'll use diabetes as the example. Next slide. Um, so it is recommended, if you've got diabetes, it's recommended you have a picture at the back of your eyes to, to prevent eye disease. And arbitrarily, we say, right, everyone should have it every year. So if you all had diabetes, you would be sent an invitation to have your eyes photographed once a year. And we do pretty well. We get about 80% coverage in a year. Next slide. The question is, is, why do we say it's a year? Why do you think we say it's a year? Because people think it's convenient to say a year. 
However, does that make sense? So we looked at our own data to stratify the screening intervals that Helen did this work. So using data we already had, we said, can we tailor pathways for individual patients? And it's a bit of a busy slide, but what it showed that if you've got type 2 diabetes and two examinations showing no eye disease, you can quite safely be offered two yearly screening. Now as a doctor, I would have said, oh, all these additional patients, we need more cameras, more graders, more money. However, by using your own information, you can stratify or tailor your treatment pathways. Why? There's so many people in this group that you can screen 44% fewer people without the quality of the service going down. So it shows you how you use data to do that. Next slide. Safer and more effective treatments. Yes, I put this in for the pharmacists. How many pharmacists in the audience? Great. <laughs> so, so the first rule of medicine is do no harm. So as we know with every medicine, it's the cost benefit or risk benefit ratio. So next slide. This is Aziz. You're probably aware of this drug, which is by far the most effective smoking cessation therapy. A couple of years ago, the FDA said it has a possible cardiovascular and neuropsychiatric side effects. Because we have patient-specific prescribing for the entire population, we can actually link data to give real-time pharmacovigilance and epidemiology. Uh, this is, I didn't put this in for you, Tom, but you'll be very pleased. Uh, so we performed the largest ever cohort study of about 150,000 using exposure to drug linked to hospitalization mortality showed it was unfounded. And actually, we're trying to drive at the truth of the safety of medicine and advise the shares at that time, John, <coughs> did go up on the back of it. But again, it's about using data we have to say, is this safe and effective for you? Next slide. More effective integrated pathways. So I'm a great believer in this journey of care, weaving that pathway of care together. Next slide. So what we've done for diabetes, now we're doing for cancer, respiratory disease, uh, multiple sclerosis, uh, stroke, and many other diseases, is to articulate these patient pathways. And this is a screen for doctors or other healthcare professionals to say, how many patients are in the referral part of the pathway? How many have been seen in my clinic? How many people are seeing? And you can click on these and actually get the individual patients. Next slide. So you actually see pathways for patients across emergency admissions, discharge, if they're in a care center, in real time. And only then will we be able to actually look at where intervention is required. Because one can then start to allocate cost to activity, which is important. Next slide. Oh, I, I can put this in. Oh, okay, next slide. Just to say that we collaborate internationally. This is something we did in Kuwait. This package of quality research, education, clinical skills, informatics. And we work with colleagues in Kuwait. I only show that because I wanted to show you me in my national dress. <laughs> uh, I'll wear it next time. <laughs> the next slide. Uh, so going back to that train of thought, can we use NHS funding or health service funding more effectively? So next slide. So here's a nationwide study of five billion pounds. So that's about 30 billion ringgit. It's a lot of ringgit. And we spend that amount of money on prescribing and hospitalization. And we show that in terms of all our people living in Scotland, 4.3 million people were responsible for some cost, okay? But if you look at it closely, 100,000 people are responsible for half the cost. And next slide. And what one can then do is break these data down. So I live in this little small town called Perth. And in a general practice in Perth, you can actually look at those patients who are driving the cost and target intervention of those patients. So in this practice, 131 people, 1.3% of the population, are responsible for 50% of the mass practice expenditure. 
So it's a way of using data to actually see what's driving your costs and then in an anticipatory way trying to interfere with those, those measures. Next slide. Oh. Driving, next slide. Driving clinical research, just to say, I'm going to talk about this this afternoon, because it's all part of the pathway. And lastly, next slide, next slide, precision medicine. How many folk have heard of the phrase precision medicine? Okay, I'm just going to talk. This is going back to the beginning of the talk about genomics. Next slide. It's the same, no, no go back off time. It's the same population model. I talked about having a population. I talked about phenotyping, so that's measuring clinical characteristics very accurately. The fact is, it's now possible to do genetics, okay, or genomics, okay? Just to, next slide. So this is one of my favorite illustrations, and it shows the power of genetics. So this is, a slide from Scandinavia, okay? And what they did is they managed to track down twins who'd been separated at birth. So these are dizygotic or unidentical twins. So what happened, they'd been born to the same mother, then they'd been separated at birth, had different environmental exposure, so they could have moved out of the country or moved into different towns or cities. Then they were photographed 20 years later, okay? And what you notice is their, their phenotype is different. These are monozygotic twins, so that means it's precisely the same genetic material, identical twins, okay? Again, they were separated at birth, different environmental exposure, and what do you notice 20 years later? Absolutely identical. A wonderful slide. Are they all female? Pardon? Why are they all female? Oh, good question. <laughs> they are all female, aren't they? So uh, I need to get the male slide. <laughs> so, uh, so in this female study of twins separated, you'll see that they're all like Next slide. And we're starting to use information across the genome. This was the first. published example of so-called population pharmacogenetics. And we looked at a common drug metformin, and actually we don't. That, professor Thomas, do you agree with this statement? A, uh, an old professor of clinical pharmacology, used to, or pharmacy, used to say to me, Morris, he said, it's easy. If you give a drug to 10 people, it works in three people. It doesn't work in three people. Three don't take it, and one has an adverse event. And actually, that's our understanding of medicine today. Isn't it? We, we often, when we give a drug, if I give someone an antihypertensive like a lodipine or a stat, you're not, you, you don't know who's going to respond, who's not going to respond, and who's going to have an adverse event. And what we're trying to do is use genetics, or pharmacogenetics, to actually tease that out. So we published widely on metformin, and we managed to identify genes which identify those who get stomach ache with metformin. But this is another example. Uh, so we used information from the electronic health record to look at therapeutic response. Next slide. And what we showed and published in Nature Genetics is those who respond to metformin have a variant near something called ATM, which is a gene but it was totally unknown to the diabetes community, but very well known to the cancer community, because it was known that ATM is cancer protective. And this work actually led to, I think there was now about 200 clinical trials internationally looking at the effect of metformin, not on diabetes, but the effect of metformin on cancer. So it shows you how we're using genetic information to unravel new insights. And just to emphasize, this technology is moving really quickly. So this was 2003 in the White House. There he was, it was Bill Clinton. It may soon be his wife that we're showing a picture of, who knows? This is Francis Collins, who's the president of the NIH. This is Craig Ventner of Solera Diagnostics. Tony Blair, do you remember him? 
He was also there, but I cut him out. <laughs> um, what were they celebrating? They, they said, we have decoded the book of life. The first human genome sequence, it took 300 scientists 15 years and three billion, three billion dollars to do one, okay? It now takes three scientists a day, we do it for a thousand dollars. And we have this technology, um, and we're beginning to implement it in practice. Next slide. And why is it important? So this is slide, this is big data, but this is, um, am I okay for time? Just tell me, because I track your work. <laughs> so what, as I said, we're beginning to use genomic information to unravel the cause of disease. So malignant melanoma is a horrible, horrible disease. At best, the five-year survival of the grade four is 15%. That means that 85, if you die, are diagnosed at that grade, 85% of people will be dead. <coughs> So by unraveling the cause of disease, we've seen that 60% of people with a, so we've got a BRAF mutation in this kinase pathway, respond to this drug here, then urafenib, okay? So if you've got a mutation here, not everyone has it, so we screen people to say, if you've got malignant myeloma, do you have this mutation? Because if you do, we'll give you this drug. Because it only works in people with this mutation. This is precision medicine. And what we see here, so these are bone scans of people before the drug and after the drug. So what you see is hot spots. You see these hot spots? That's the bladder, okay? So that would light up. These are the kidneys. But what you see is hot spots in the bones. See these hot spots? And what you see a month after treatment? It's quite traumatic, isn't it? So this the ability to be precise in the way we use these new biologic agents can transform the treatment of disease. Likewise here, look at all these hot spots, they disappear. That is precision medicine. Next slide. So what we're doing in the UK is bringing whole genome sequencing into the NHS. So we're doing 100,000 patients initially with rare diseases, with cancer and with infection to, to try and demonstrate precise diagnosis to try and improve um, the outlook for some of these uh, very challenging diseases. So this is genomic medicine is coming. Next slide. And we're doing this in Scotland and we put about 150 million pounds into this. Next slide. And it is about connecting this ecosystem and I would challenge Malaysia to think, how do we create an ecosystem that can join all this up? Because it has huge value, not only for quality of care for patients and populations, but also for economic growth. Um, next slide. And here's an example of that. This is a 64 million euro project across Europe. A lot of industry partners. So we're leading this from Edinburgh, and it's a study of Alzheimer's disease. And why are we leading it from Edinburgh? Because we've got the science and we've got the data. And it is driving economic growth and creating jobs. Okay, next slide. Uh, next slide, I'll look back on that. So, so that's an example of where big data has come from and is going. But what are the big issues in this? What are we going to have to grapple with if this is going to be a success? So I have five big issues and so then I'll finish. Number one, it's a tidal wave of data. Next slide. So a single genome is about three gigabytes of data. The, the phrase big data is actually a computer science term, meaning you need massive parallelization to um, uh, cope with the analysis. So I actually prefer data science to be a phrase. Uh, but this, because of these big data, we need new approaches to accessing, manipulating, visualizing, and we need to bring in uh, computer science and look at the use of private cloud-based computing. So I realize something that we can discuss how much of this can we do in the cloud. Next slide, because I like that slide. Can you show it again, go back? <laughs> there we go, oh yeah. So, 
because medicine is becoming increasingly data intensive. And how are we going to assimilate all this information you know, in terms of biomarkers, cohorts, quantification, all these things I've talked about. How do we ensure regulation in real time? You can have these slides, Dr. Next slide. Um, so this is the and just to emphasize that the private sector is driving this. So Apple have launched something called Research Kit, which is a software platform which is recruiting patients with Parkinson's heart disease and other conditions in real time. And they recruited 11,000 people in a week by going straight to the public. So this is happening. Next slide. The second big issue is around digital maturity of health systems, so-called how mature are we? Because today I've been suggesting that we should be moving towards precision or personalized medicine prescriptive analytics, but we won't be able to do that if our health systems aren't digitally mature. So this is a pretty crude scale, but it shows where are you on a scale of fragmented point solutions through to automated reporting through to population health management, precision medicine. And health systems have fallen behind the curve. Next slide. So these are UK, but that doesn't show very well. But in the UK, we're only about level two to three on that scale. The States is about four, uh, and Spain's about 4.6. So we need major investments into health systems to become digitally mature if this is gonna work. Next slide. Third thing is about delivering at scale, and these are some of my friends, because we're trying to do this for the whole of the UK. And a discussion I think we should have on the panel of the afternoon is how do we gear this up in Malaysia? So this figure has now gone up to about 200 million pounds of investment to join us up across the UK. Next slide, because we want us, we want as to be the, uh, set the international standard in the trustworthy uses of electronic patient records for research at scale for the entirety of the nation. Next slide. So we're weaving together, this slide doesn't show the project of Wales, Scotland, and big parts of England. Next slide. And collaboratively looking at this to drive research, public engagement, get the governance right, get the cohorts enabled to deliver impact nationally and internationally. So think scale, how do we scale this? Next slide. And this is our institute. This is a data science institute for health for the whole of Scotland. We brought all these universities together with industry, with the healthcare provider to drive this agenda. So computer scientists, social scientists, government folk, industry folk, driving this agenda. What's the best bit about this building? You notice? Free parking. Right, okay, next slide. And we put similar buildings in London, so if you go to London on Euston Road, we put similar buildings in Manchester and Wales. Doing this at scale. Next slide. The other thing we've done is linked our non-health data sets. This is cross-government, the good governance working. Uh, so next slide. So I've talked about the data available to us on the nationwide, whether it's imaging, laboratory, outpatients, GP. But we've also, with good governance, had the ability to link with educational data, air pollution data, environmental data, community care data, census data, and then one gets a complete picture of the uh, contributors of health in society. So this requires very good governance, which I'll touch upon later. But this shows you the types of data that we've brought together within the same environment. Next slide. And um, I'll skip that one, next slide. The fourth big issue, and I would ask where your talent lies in Malaysia, is informatics. Computer science. Next slide. So we were fortunate in Edinburgh. We've got the largest informatics research excellence in Europe, and we've got thousands of people basically doing computer science. And what we're trying to do is get them to take an interest in healthcare and medicine. Next slide. It's about talent, knowledge, so that you create disruptive innovation, so you co-create solutions for your health system. Next slide. 
And I'm delighted to say that we are, we've got 66 nationalities for very cosmopolitan. I'm just checking, is the Malaysian flag there? <laughs> Is it at the top? Should be. There we go. There it is. So we have. Um, we we you know we we're, we're very fortunate to have such an interdisciplinary community. Next slide. And we also work very closely with industry because industry has a lot of the tools. As I said about Rolls Royce, why don't we take Rolls Royce learning into healthcare? So we work very collaboratively with industry. Next slide. And, and this has driven economic growth. So in terms of startups and spin-outs, etc. Next slide, I'm conscious of time. And this shows you the sort of computer science excellence we have. But I don't think you can do big data without this. So if healthcare tries to go it alone, you, you will really struggle. So we need to think how we weave this expertise in. Next slide. Because when I look to my computer science friends, they talk about sensors, robotics, natural language processing. So that's about taking a clinical letter and being able to structure data out of it to say, I've read this letter, this patient has the following disease. Machine learning, data linkage, data architectures, these things are moving at tremendous speed and we're seeing confluence. So the message is we need to get these skills and expertise into healthcare. Next slide. So shown schematically, we've got medical informatics, we've got physical data, as I've talked about, organizational data and personal data. Next slide. And we've got areas of expertise in genomics, the Far Institute does the health science data, the administrative data does the administrative data, the NHS data. Next slide. We're bringing these capabilities, which are pretty alien to medicine, actually. Are there any experts in natural language processing in the room? Well, great, fantastic. The question is, is how do we create a hundred of you guys? <laughs> because we'll need you. Any any roboticists in the room? Well, we know roboticists. Are you putting a hand up? <laughs> but th this is the challenge. Next slide. And only then will we be able to harness these big data for new therapeutic interventions, effective personalizations, etc. So that's the thesis, that's the game plan. Next slide. And to show the industry dimension, this is a Google map of Edinburgh. Next slide. In the last 10 years, next slide, you've seen lots of businesses clustering around which have created jobs. And the best way of supporting good health is to give someone a job. <laughs> okay, next slide. And lastly, I'm conscious of time, just to say the biggest, of, biggest issue of all is designing for transparency and trust with big data goes to big responsibility. So we spent 25, 30 years looking at trustworthy approach to this in terms of governance and infrastructure. Next slide. Um, we've got to be very, you know, the public tell us that they're worried about this stuff. So how do we want a relationship with the public? Next slide. So that there is not a trust in data deficit, because that's a real risk. So trust is the number one issue here. Next slide. And in the UK, there are daily concerns Ireland, from Japan, about loss of data. Have you had any big data losses in Malaysia? It is a constant concern. So next slide. So I won't go into detail, we can talk about it, but we've designed for trustworthy use of data and transparency and developed a governance infrastructure and a technical infrastructure with public scrutiny which actually ensures that the way we approach this carries the public trust with us. And we've done a lot of public engagement with, with to ask the public what, you know, help us, guide us in making this work. Next slide. And we've also put health policy. So with my Scottish government hat on, we've got government policy, a data vision for Scotland. Do you have a data vision for Malaysia? Do you have a data vision for Malaysia? And then how we do it, the data linkage strategy. So this needs, this is the, the, the approach we've taken. Next slide. 
and we have these trusted research environments, so-called safe havens, where this stuff is done. So if you can't just do it anywhere, we design purposefully to do it in a trustworthy way. Next slide. And we have proportionate governance to this approach, which I'm happy to talk about how we handle privacy, etc. Next slide. So to conclude, uh, Dr. Go, thank you for inviting me to uh, this big data conference. If we're going to succeed in this space, eight C's for success. Commitment to public trust and engagement in everything we do. Maintain a clinical focus. Develop a convergence of care with innovation and research. And collaborate, not only across government healthcare providers, but with the commercial sector in a transparent way. Computer science, I've identified as essential, and we need to capacity build in people who understand this stuff. There are insufficient data scientists in healthcare and have clarity about governance and data sharing. And I guess today is about asking, can, uh, is there an opportunity for Malaysia to lead the way to achieve this defragmentation and alignment will be key. So next slide. So thank you very much. I'm very impressed by your campus. I wish my campus was like that. Um, so thank you for inviting me to talk about some of the work we're doing. And we're all meeting in Wales in all this, if you're interested in this. So thank you for your generous Professor Morris, uh, we finished a little ahead of time. We'd like to yeah, ask very questions. Very if, you, if anybody has questions, uh, please raise your hand and we get a mic to you. Just ask that you identify yourself so that <coughs> Professor no Morris has an idea of your background. My question is about uh, uh, here you're talking about the data in general, but how about unstructured data or semi structured data? Do you deal with this data? If yes, how we So that's a very a good question. Uh, and most data are actually unstructured. So I've talked today a lot about COVID data, so that we use the code. But as I was suggesting, um, a, lot, a lot of data, especially in clinical correspondence, for example, is unstructured. Uh, the imaging data. So what we, uh, we're in the foothills of where we need to go. We are collaborating with the academic community and also the industrial community. Is anyone from IBM here? Yeah. Oh, there's the gentleman. That's why you put your hand up there. <laughs> so uh, there are some amazing technologies coming to market looking at unstructured data, uh, especially um, around natural language processing. Watson is an example of that. The, the challenge we have is that domain specificity because context is so important. So if we ran a NLP across Scottish data, it would be very different to Malaysia. So that's why one needs to co-create to derive value from unstructured data, is my sense. So we're, we're we're strong there, but I, I find it hard to point anywhere in the world that's really strong with unstructured data. Then you've got voice data in other imaging data, so uh, you're a young man, you've got a great career ahead of you. <laughs> uh, good morning, Professor Morris and the leads. Okay, my name is Veronica from the School of Psychology. Uh, the question here is that as a clinical psychologist, my main issue is with the uh, Privacy Act, yeah. yeah, all right, and as you mentioned before as well, so uh, what is your uh, good suggestion based on your extreme years of experience in uh, overcoming and getting uh, things done? Okay, so. Thank you. So, uh, Veronica, I think that's, this is, this is a, a key issue. But first of all, there's no simple answer to this. Firstly, I think it's about convening the right team with the skills who can actually guide us through this. So, 20 years ago, we wrote in a medical research grant that we wanted to fund social scientists, people who understand how to run public interest, public engagement activities, and lawyers, imagine medical researchers funding lawyers, 
to have it actually to guide us on a legal construct and framework which would allow us to progress. So first of all, it's about configuring an interdisciplinary team of uh, government folk, academics, but also with these skills to come up with a blueprint for a suggestion. And the public needs to be part of that. The second thing is, I think if you wait for policy in this space to emerge top down, then you'll wait forever. Uh, I think, I think our, our approach was to do some much lower risk grassroots stuff so that within three months, six months, or a year, we could demonstrate the value that sharing data actually created. So the diabetes example was a good example. We did that initially at a local level, regional level, then national level. And when someone asked me in the audience, you know, how can you share those data? I said, well, we share those data because we've shown that with good sharing, the benefit has been 300 less amputations. It actually demonstrates the benefit. My worry is if you do it purely from policy down, then um, the what ifs could actually stifle any progress at all. What you then need to do, however, and what we've been successful is having demonstrated the value and built trust in the system is reinforce that policy. So it's not just an academic endeavor. Uh, so consult with the public, start small, build an interdisciplinary routine about it and communicate everything you do, why you're doing it, and how you're mitigating the risks through safeguards. So, is that okay? It's hard stuff. But I see in so many countries they're not moving on. Data are not shared. Uh, an example, I don't know, this is this may be a bit controversial. Um, do you remember that tragedy over the uh, French Spanish Alps where the, the co pilot took the plane down? And you know, it came out last week that he was known to have psychiatric disease and been referred, but his doctors could not share that information. How would the families who are affected by that? So, so this is not an absolute thing. It's again, it's, it's about the risk benefit and how one tries to design expert systems that points us towards benefit. It will never be risk free. So that's why we need clever lawyers. In two words, I'm a director of hospital and medical administrator. My question is, um, how does a professor of medicine um, come, to, <laughs> how did that come about? I mean, by sheer grit of needing data to show something, that you become a medical informatics expert. Um, yeah, I'm sure you are a leader in this area. So obviously, you are the one who actually guides, harness this group of people. So how? Could you share with us some experience? How do you, how do you do it? How do you bring up this uh, topic into you know? Yeah, I'm just caught with it. Okay. Um, so so I'm not I'm not really an expert. I'm not an informatics. Expert. I know a little bit about it. Again, I think it's about configuring teams. Uh, for example, I don't have a who here has a single office. Who has their own office? Oh good, you all share open space. So I share an office with two other folk, and one of them is the Dean of the School of Informatics. Because this is such complex stuff, it's about getting that intercept right between knowing the domain. I talked about the intersection of mathematics, statistics, computer science, and medicine. So I'm not bad at the medical bit of it. And I understand a little bit about the computer science, but I always need to understand it. So it's about getting teams together. I would say the United States are ahead of us. For the 20 years they've had dedicated capacity building schemes in medical and biomedical informatics. And it's actually seen as a respectable thing to do. Whereas in the UK, and I'm sure it's the same here, if you're a doctor, you're a doctor. But actually we do need to start capacity building in information science. To give you an idea, at the University of Edinburgh, where I work, we're now insisting that Everyone does a six-year medical degree. 
and they have to take a year out, and everyone has to do a diploma in data science. So we're, we're insisting everyone has a diploma in data science. In Stanford, I understand 90% of all graduates have some data science qualification, even if you're in finance. So I think it's important for the university to consider you know, how do we prepare for the Hello, Professor. My name is Dr. Adam Pong. I'm the head of one of the CRC Penny Registers and Professor in Kuching, where you were in, in the 1980s, still in primary school. Uh, are you sure you were born? <laughs> uh, I have two questions. Uh, first would be the issue of ownership, data ownership. Yeah. Uh, how much the individual of the policy uh, 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 the data owner actually uh, is able to access. Uh, second is the issue of uh, uh, capacity building. Because, for example, you're collecting data and lots of it. As, as we move towards a uh, more data intensive type of uh, information, such as imaging, yeah. uh, MRI, cardiac CT, uh, who funds for the storage of these uh, data sets? Okay. So, so, so. Data ownership is a complex issue internationally because the laws of the land will define who owns data. So, for example, even in the UK, um, in England, they've got a law which says that the Secretary of State, the Minister, owns the data. <coughs> Interestingly, in Scotland, we didn't legislate. We, used, we worked within the existing legislative framework that allowed us to make more progress. Sometimes legislation is so I'd be, again, it's about defining uh, proportionate governance and being crystal clear around what I call the benefit sharing. Because in doing all this stuff, you know, there was a consultation last week on access and use of data by industry. And the public quite rightly said, if this is pure and simply going to be used by industry to make profit, we're not so keen on that. However, if there's a, a, a public good benefit, then they're more comfortable. So I think ownership is an issue, but it's also about defining benefits and being transparent and trustworthy in the benefit definition. That's where our social scientists help. In terms of the imaging and storage, yeah, you're right, we've got a petabyte of images for Scotland. However, we're seeing a storage cost so are going down. So the, the health service pays for that, basically. Um, I'm talking this afternoon about research applications for this art if you're still here. Um, but you live in a beautiful city, by the way. For now, we will enter the second presentation of the morning. So with that, let us put our hands together as we invite Professor P.T. Thomas to the stage again to chair the next session and to introduce the speakers. Thank you for coming back. Uh, the next uh, speaker is Dr. Uh, Mohammad Kazez Sheikh Ahmad. He is the Deputy Director and also the Head of the Health Informatics Center of the Ministry of Health. Dr. Kazez is a certified occupational health physician and he received his MD degree from UKM, the National University of Malaysia, Master's degree in Occupational Medicine from the National University of Singapore, and PhD in Occupational Health from the University of Birmingham. He has been drafting health laws, medical ethics, and was a pioneer and instrumental in initiating traditional and complementary medicine services in Hospital Palabatas, Hospital Putrajaya, and Hospital Sultan Ismail. And in this includes the registration of traditional and complementary medicine practitioners in Malaysia. Since the late 2008, Dr. Kaze hates the development and operation of the electronic health information and management system and the development of the health informatics standards for Malaysia. He now leads the development of the Malaysian Health Data Warehouse Project, acquiring and development of POC of SNOMED CT for the implementation in Ministry of Health Hospitals, development of Malaysian Health Data Dictionary and the development and rolling out of web-based version of medical care information system 
that collects granular data for discharged patients and those attending daycare services. Dr. Kaze is also involved in the implementation of hospital information system and the Malaysian Health Information Exchange. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Muhammad Kaze. So that is a huge difference. And 
we are also talking about real time and also right time. For the purpose of implementing the Malaysian Health Data Warehouse, this stage is about right time. Right time is when you stipulate the time. It is every day, 24 hours. It is weekly, monthly, and whatnot. But real time is about data comes in and you get it. It's not really. Uh, it's not really about immediately you get it because there may be some process where the data is clean. And as long as you don't stipulate the time frame for that purpose, we call it right time, real time. The moment you stipulate this time, then it becomes right time. And I think within the Ministry of Health environment, the real time data is mainly for the multiple disease. And the technology, technology is slightly different, but we are trying to prepare our nation health our health to cater for the uh, real-time environment in the near future. And there's also a confusion about what they call HRS. HRS is an acronym. Um, it is, in Malaysia, it is Hospital Information System. It is the operating system for the hospital. Internationally, it is Health Information System, which is about data management the WHO call it HMIS, Health Information Management System. In some of the meetings that we attended, we were talking about HIS and HIS as HMIS, and some people were talking about HIS as Hospital Information System. So I think it's good to clarify this uh, to know. The project that we are running at the moment is uh, Malaysian Health and Health House, with emphasis on a government-owned security system which is developed by NEMOS. I think this is one of the important agenda when we uh, propose for this project. Why government agenda? We want to feel secure. I think everybody wants to know that if I submit my data, is that secure enough? So the first level is, okay, this is government technology. Government-owned technology, which is new. And hopefully they will last that long. Because some of the technology, it doesn't long because it it doesn't belong to an entity we call a government. And uh, we also develop what we call a scalable platform. And we will start with the SMRP or the Medical Care Information System. Scalable meanings of the future development of a system that will fit data into that data warehouse. It is the same platform. So we will start with SMRP and PRIS for August delivery of this project. And included in this project is what we call harmonization and codification using SNOMAD City. This is one of the um, medical technology. And this is to cater for the semi-structured and in the near future towards um, unstructured data. I, I like the presentation on uh, this morning. And one of the things that we say we use the term harmonization because people say the same thing, but it's not the same thing. Um, when we talk about, uh, when we talk to cardiology uh, about um, fast actual population, and you search the uh, SNOMAD City uh, engine, you couldn't find it because the term that they use is rapid. And we work with the line group of people from Regent Street. In Malaysia, they call it full blood picture. But in the system, they call it complete blood picture. So they ask me why? Because there's no such thing as full blood picture or empty blood picture. But there's only complete or incomplete blood picture. So this is English, I'm not discussing that. But you know, it is very important you know, before we start with the uh, terminology standard that we clarify the standard. And that is why the exercise is we harmonize first. We understand each other and then only we codify. Otherwise, it doesn't work. Okay? And it is quite an exercise to do that. And I would like to propose maybe in the near future, we have what we call harmonizer. And also to include in that is our GIS, and also uh, this is not a local technology, this is based on Archis technology.
Why MIMOS? These are the reasons, but I'm not going to spell it out. Just in case MIMOS nanti dia ni hal itu. But by the way, MIMOS, uh, MIMOS is government, so they can't do that. And to be fair, it's not uh, directed that we must use MIMOS technology. What we did was, we started out with best of breed. And then we were introduced to MIMOS and we received directive and we proposed for mix and match depending on the technology capabilities and to incorporate some of the local technology. So what we did was, when we asked for the best of breed people to come up with the POC, proof of concept, we asked MIMOS to do the same thing. To show off technology that they have, and the most important criteria for us is the data must be right. You know, um, it's. I think it's beautiful to see all this fancy graph and whatnot, but the figure is not. The figure must be right. So that is the important criteria before we proceed to see the other component of that presentation. And number two, reduce cost. So about 30% less. Because they don't charge on the license. Sorry, they do charge on the license. It's only one ringgit. Not one pound, not one euro. It's only one ringgit. But we have to pay for the development because they have to bring in people to do that. So it is the security, it is the reduce cost, but they were tested for that purpose. So um, when we roll out this, 93% of the technology is local MIMOS. So when you see my, my refers to MIMOS. So one of the products that we are going to show you is what we call my harmony. This is MIMOS technology that will uh, harmonize and then later codify the database that we have uh, into Snowman City coded database. I'm not going through that. Um, this is lengthy because I wanted to focus on the demo. But this is the work that we have done since 2011. The policies, the direction, and whatnot. And data warehouse, you know, and that's why I like the first presentation, trusted. You know. It is to be a trusted source of truth of comprehend comprehensive healthcare data. Data must come from every person. You know, you have a person visiting the outpatient, inpatient, uh, clinical support, a traditional complementary medicine, family health, antenatal, and everything. And in the data warehouse, we should be able to link them up. For example, you know there were 2.4 million admitted to the Ministry of the Hospital, and we do have the coding in ICD-10. You would know these are the person diagnosed as stroke. And you can follow up with how many of them actually were detected at the outcare, uh, outpatient, and how many end up would follow up with the physios, with the occupational therapies, <coughs> even with the traditional and complementary medicine people for the purpose of acupuncture and. Um, Massage. Okay. So this is the intention to have a snapshot of every every visit and encounter to the personnel, and to provide the um, value-added data for the people in Ministry how to make the policy. Yeah. This are uh, these were the basis for our work. So we have done, um, for example. This should be built based on national health informatics standard. So we have data addiction in place. We have data modeling in place now. We even have now uh, LOIN. We have SNOMAT City. Hopefully we can roll it out, even though it's not yet integrated. Uh, overarching healthcare system, we just had our first uh, governance workshop to listen to the players, what do they think about security access and whatnot. 
but we won't be the team that will formulate the policy. I think there will be a team established at the ministry level who issue, but we will be feeding them on the concern that we get from the workshops. This is very important. Information is available in right time. It's not real time yet. Even though when we first uh, started with this project, they were already talking about right time. Sorry, real time. Okay. There's always a concern about real time data in the sense that you know you want to make sure that it is properly validated. Uh, and uh, how can you verify that it is validated with real time data? So we are working on that because we also need different set of technology. <coughs> I was informed that we were informed that you know uh, if it is 30 million for this right time data project then it's 300 million for the real-time data. Yeah. Um, anything about technology, please ask the most people. I'm the domain. That is my escape clause. <laughs> Built once, use many. You can see that once we have the data modeling in place, it can be repeated. It can make the system very efficient. Yeah. So when we say uh, this is integrated operable, Whatever you collect at the um, outpatient level or inpatient, you can connect to the other data that you are collecting from the other visit. Okay. And the rest. Okay. So hopefully we can deliver Malaysian Health Data Warehouse with all these characteristic elements. Is the problem still? If you run a project, ICT project, on a standalone, I think that is easy and straightforward. But because we want to reduce, we want to reduce multiple data entry, repeat, so there's a lot of interdependency. The first two projects that comes with data warehouse is the uh, system malware data. You get admitted to the hospital, we collect your info. And if you're diagnosed as cancer, we flow the data into patient registry information system because the first module that we will deliver in patient registry information system is on cancer. So we are building a system that will automatically, the moment you are notified as having cancer, in SMRP, and the moment you have a visit to any of the healthcare facilities, it will automatically flow into patient registry information system. And the clinician responsible for that patient registry information system on cancer, if they are given the access, will update the patient registry. Sounds beautiful, but let's see after one year. are the complex interdependency when you run the project. This is, this is where we want to go. And this is the first collecting system, system Maluma Rotam Rotam collecting system, to fit into that. And this will fit into patient registry information system, so that, you know, uh, we minimize the double data entry. We are trying to make sure that hospital information system integrate with our economy. <coughs> Otherwise, if they don't have the system, they have to key in manually. It is a web system. And we are now working with TBC and OGIS group, which is operating system for the clinic. They are wanting to send their data straight to the Tawai House. We are working on that. And then we are working with external agencies, for example. We are working with the Department of Statistics. We need this population data. And then we are also working with environmental data because we have this project, national project, they call it. So hopefully, this is what we call the TTIP uh, Pertemuan. 
in, in military Malay. In English, it would be a point of meeting or meeting point for all the data so that it can be generated from it. Uh, if you are concerned about data ownership, if you are concerned about uh, security, that all comes under governance. We in Health Public Center is not responsible for the policy. We will be the secretariat. I think uh, we are proposing that Mr. Shahnas or the uh, Zuti Director General to be the chair of that committee. So we are now um, engaging with the stakeholders to listen to their concern and whatnot. So please bear with me. I will. I may not be able to answer some of the. Uh, question you may ask. Okay. Besides Mission Health Data Warehouse, uh, we have been a members of uh, ISSEO and then for the purpose of um, using Stonacity in our project. And can I start with the demo? We started sometimes in 2013. Uh, it's a very tricky subject because it's all about relationships, you know. Uh, it's not like you call this, this is the code, it's not direct. You must know whether this is coming from, this is about anatomy, the statement, whether this is about the clinical and whatnot. And uh, what we need is um, an expert, semantic, uh, natural language processing, and that is in the team from Mimos, aided by uh, Dr. Dixon, I work very closely with Dr. Khalil and Dr. Dixon. So uh, if I can show you the demo of what is coming. <laughs> 